Good morning. Good morning, Father Brian. Oh, good morning, Father Chaz. <laughs> I heard everybody, but I heard your voice because you're on the microphone, so there you go. Well, in this morning's gospel, it's good for us to um, take a walk back as if we were in the crowd of Jesus. This is a story that is heard very differently by ears that were contemporary to Jesus rather than by our own modern ears. So you have to remember the, the context of this day's gospel because it helps us to understand what Jesus is doing and what he's looking for. Remember in the last few weeks, we've been following more or less the sort of the chronological chapters of, the, of Matthew's story of Jesus. And very recently, we've listened as Jesus has uh, f fed the 5,000 right along the Sea of Galilee. And after he fed the 5,000, he uh, sent them away and came to his disciples walking upon water. And after he walked upon water, they're still in the area of Galilee. We did not hear this. We skipped over this little episode before uh, hearing this morning's gospel. After Jesus comes across to the other side, he is met by Pharisees from Jerusalem who come and argue with him about their tradition of how it is that you're supposed to eat your food and what is it that defiles the, the, the human person. And they said, you, your disciples, they eat food with unwashed hands. It defiles them to eat that food. And Jesus has this great argument with the Pharisees saying, why are you replacing uh, the commands of God with these man-made traditions? Do you not know that it is not what we put into our mouth that defiles us, but what comes out of our mouth, right, that defiles us? And from this conversation, we pick up the story now and we hear that Jesus removes himself to the cities of Tyre and Sidon. Again, this is some important historical context, especially if you're following Jesus in the crowd. Because Tyre and Sidon are north of the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee is kind of like the northern boundary of the kingdom of Israel. So if you were to go uh, from the Sea of Galilee west to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and then go north, you would meet these two coastal towns. Now these are pagan cities that Jesus is entering. And they were uh, part of the ancient kingdom of the Canaanites, which were groups, tribes, various tribes of people that were sort of collectively called the people of Canaan. And this is historically important to Jesus or to you if you were a Jew because uh, the Canaanites were your enemies. These were in fact the people that needed to be conquered when God's people Israel crossed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. So they spent time fighting back these people for this land to establish God's kingdom on earth. And they continued uh, to sort of, um, to war against you. And even in the time of the king, the great King David, he uh, waged military campaigns against all of the, the Canaanite peoples. Now the Canaanite peoples were, were strong. They, fight, they fought against God's people. They were pagan. They didn't believe in the God of Israel, but over the centuries, since the time of King David, they were eventually uh, persecuted themselves and taken over by the kingdom of the Persians and then uh, eventually by the, by the empire of Rome. And you are also at this time taken over by the empire of Rome. But Tyre and Sidon have now since been rebuilt as kind of Roman colonies. They're trading, major trading cities because they are the entrance to the great land of the East, the Asias. And so as Jesus withdraws from the Sea of Galilee into the region of Tyre and Sidon, you're very curious as to why he's doing this, because he himself says, I am the Messiah of the Jewish people. But he's leaving his home turf, fleeing to the north, into the pagan lands. And we find as we witness, as we observe Jesus, that Jesus is going into the Gentile territory. And it seems, in fact, very purposeful that he's going to meet this Gentile woman, this Canaanite woman, because right after this episode, Jesus is going to return to the area of the Sea of Galilee. So he has this kind of very purposeful moment 
that we kind of discover along the way. It is one of the very interesting stories of a Jesus meeting a pagan, because to our modern ears, of course, it sounds like Jesus is being really rude, right? Calling people dogs, ignoring people, saying, my doctrine is not for you, I didn't come for you. And yet, what is happening is, to your eyes, um, it's a strong part of the rabbinic tradition. So Jesus, who is a Jewish rabbi, right, a, a, according to his own people, is doing something that rabbis would do when approached by a pagan, when approached by a foreigner who wanted to recognize the God of Israel and become Jewish. In fact, this was uh, uh, a long-standing tradition. We heard in the first reading, even in the time of the prophets, the prophet Isaiah said, "Those, even those foreigners who come to me, who want to worship the God of Israel, I will allow them. Their sacrifices will be acceptable before me. They may worship me, because my house is a house of prayer for all peoples. We know as Christians that Jesus came to save all peoples. But he himself said, my first responsibility is to my own. Although in this moment, he is teaching his disciples who follow him that it's not only to the Jewish people that I have come to save, it is also to the Gentiles. And so when this Canaanite woman comes before him, what he does is he plays with her the rabbinic tradition of conversion, which was this. If someone wanted to convert to Judaism, they were rejected three times. They would say, I want to come and be part of uh, the, the people of Israel. No, you may not come. You may not come. They would have to return and say, no, I, I, the God of the Jews, I want that to be my God. No, you may not join us. No, let your people be my people. Let your God be my God. I say to you, you cannot be with us. Jewish conversion was a testing, and there's only one way for one's true faith to be tested, and, that is, and it is precisely that. It needed to be, you, do, are you really sure? Are you really sure? In fact, are you prepared to give up your pagan gods to truly become a worshiper of the true God of Israel? And, then, and if after three rejections they came back a fourth time and said, please, let me worship the God that you worship. Then they were, they were allowed to be initiated into God's people. And this is, in fact, exactly how the story goes. Because the woman comes to Jesus saying, Lord, son of David, have pity on me. My daughter is tormented by a demon. You hear a Canaanite woman say that to Jesus, and you're immediately thinking of the context, the sort of the racial and ethnic divide between her people and your people. To, for, for this Canaanite woman to call Jesus Lord is immediately um, different to you, because there is only one person that's called Lord, and every Jewish person knows who alone is called Lord. Ultimately, the one alone who was called Lord was the God of heaven. This was a prayer that the Jewish people would say every day from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord our God is Lord alone. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. This was the greatest commandment in the entire Jewish law. And here is this pagan woman coming before a Jewish rabbi and calling him the name that only God is allowed to have. And not only that, she says, Lord, son of David. She recognizes that this is the son of the king of Israel, the kingdom that was an enemy of her own people. But here in simply calling him, calling Jesus, Lord, son of David, have pity on me. She is recognizing in Jesus, not only the kingdom of God that came from the Jewish people, but also Jesus the Messiah, the Lord. 
And notice why Jesus continues to enter into this conversation, because of course it says, at first she's rebuffed, he says nothing, silence, the first rejection. She continues to call out a second time. The disciples say, send her away. And he says, the second rejection, I, I have come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, second rejection. But she says, please, Lord, help me a third time. And he says, it is not right to give the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. A great test. This was the pejorative term that the people of Israel would call the pagans. And after three rejections, what does she say? Oh, but Lord, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the master's table. It's a great mirror of even some of the Old Testament stories, most exceptionally the story of Ruth, one of the great figures of the ancient people of Israel who herself was a pagan. She was a Moabite. She went through this same process in order to become part of God's people. And then Jesus says, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And from that instant, from that hour, her daughter is healed. Why is Jesus doing this? Because he, as his disciples follow him, they have seen what he has seen, that he has shown himself able to care for the needs of all people. He's done this great miracle of feeding the 5,000 of his own people. He's done this great miracle of walking upon water, showing himself to be Lord of creation, master even over the elements. And now he's having this great argument with the religious leaders of his, of his own tribe who are warring against him. And he's like, what can I do? Here is Jesus come to be the Jewish Messiah, begging for the faith of his own people and not receiving that faith. And so to shame his own people, he takes this journey to pagan territory where he doesn't have to convince anybody because the pagan herself comes before recognizing who is the Lord and saying, I place myself humbly underneath you because I know that what I need only you can give. And here in this moment, we see her conversion not simply to Judaism, what we see is her conversion to Jesus. We see her conversion to the Messiah. And when Jesus sees her faith, he tests that faith. And he says, in effect, are you ready? Are you really willing? Look at all of these pagan temples around you. Look at all of this land, which is an enemy to the God of Israel. Are you ready to give that up? And she says, even if it's for the scraps. That's great faith. That's persevering faith. And Jesus, as it becomes clear from this story, is very willing to go out of his way to find people who are willing to place great faith in him, even if that is to the shame of his own people. So this is a, 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 a great lesson for our days. Jesus, through all the centuries, he would say this himself before he entered Jerusalem for the last time before his death. He would say, the Son of Man, how he searches for faith, but when he comes, will he find it? Will he find faith? Jesus, who continues to search us out, every human soul in the world is begging so many people for their faith. And does he find it in our world? Does he find our world a world full of faith in him? Well, we know that answer is quite obvious. But he does go to those who are willing to find him, and he searches them out. And when he searches out a soul that exhibits true faith, he tests that faith. He doesn't promise that faith makes uh, his grace easy. He's going to say to us, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you really sure? Are you ready to give up all other things? Am I enough? And if he finds faith that is persevering, see what that faith produces but miracles. 
but blessing, divine blessing. But provision that can only come from the divine hand. And what it does for me is it reminds me of uh, a, a short but very memorable poem written by St. Teresa of Avila. She was this great 16th century Carmelite nun. She was a mystic. She had great revelations of uh, the person of Jesus. And after she died, uh, her uh, religious confreres collected the very small number of her belongings, and they, and they took her prayer book, it's called the Breviary, and they opened her Breviary, and they found this poem that she had written. And it's one of the most well-known writings that we have of St. Teresa. And it's just a, a sort of an eight-line poem called St. Teresa's Bookmark. And what it, uh, what it describes in these sort of artistic words, these beautiful words, is the very truth that Jesus reveals about faith and about coming under his lordship and about his desire, his heart which begs faith from you and from me. She says this, let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. Everything passes. God never changes. Patience obtains all things. Whoever has God wants for nothing. God alone is enough. <laughs> 